SJC 12308, Christian Miranda v. Richard Carey, Justice of the Superior Court. Mr. Schubert, good morning still. Good morning, Your Honor. <clears throat> if Your Honor, please. I'm here to argue on behalf of Christian Miranda and I think that at the very beginning I should put what I want this court to do. I want it to be clear that I think that this court has the authority, the power, and an obligation to order a new trial ordered in his case. The reasons why. The Farrakh matter represents, I believe, and I think it's pretty clear, a systemic breakdown of the entire system here. And it's absolutely clear after the Annie Dukin matter and that a sharply divided court here in Bridgman too, as to what we're going to do about two incredible situations, Dugan and now Farrakh. I have been criticized by the Commonwealth for alleged forum selection in this matter. I would argue to the court I merely showed up where they called the ball game to be held. I was not a person who actually specially assigned Justice Richard Carey to conduct the hearings in the Farrakh matter. I would point out to the court that while I'm no scholar of old time law, I think that we established in Powell versus Alabama in 1932 that seven people should not be representing in excess of 20,000 people, it's impossible. And I would say that Glasser versus the United States makes it even clearer that this just can't happen. But it did happen. I would suggest to the court that what we do know. But you it, can bring, you can make a discovery motion in your own case. We don't, you know, you have to show up and play your games, not uh, the other team's games. So why isn't that an adequate remedy for you? Because, Your Honor, I filed an MNT in Christian Miranda's case, which was denied by the judge, saying, Mr. Schubert, you haven't met your burden to prove to me that the enterprise and major crimes officers that were involved in the testimony in the Miranda case were in fact involved in the cover-up in the Sonia Farrakh matter. So I did, I filed an MNT. I went to the other playground, but I went originally to the and, Farrakh and matter in Chester's care. you have an appeal in that case too, right? Yes, we filed an appeal. And so that's gonna come up in its ordinary course, and if they were wrong there, the judge was wrong there, that's how we deal with these things. Well, there, I would- is there, have you ever, is there any case you can cite where you're allowed to intervene in another criminal case? Um, any support for this idea? Once we've laid out, I believe, the fact no, that- No, I'm asking about precedent. I have any no case cases? that I can cite you off the top Isn't, of my head, Your Honor. Don't you think that's of some significance, that there's no, no case I, out there? I do not at all, Your Honor. I believe that I had an absolute right to file an intervener because I represented a client who had material issues that were to be decided by a specially assigned judge to decide the Farrakh matter. So I believe that I had an absolute right. And as I said, I did exhaust my remedy and I would suggest to your honor that where I see a fallacy there is that I think that we all know that justice delayed is justice denied. I don't wanna be here two years from now arguing this same situation relative to losing all over again. I would suggest to you that when we originally look at this, there was an examination allegedly exposing what went on in the Merrigan Velas report. This court is well aware of that report and it found no wrongdoing by anyone. I would suggest to you that at least three judges of, the, of this court in, in Bridgman too would have found incredible problems with that uh, implication. I mean, it, it was a judgment, in fact. 
So one of the reasons that we go to the hearing and the special assignment before Richard Carey, I think this court knows that I'm a practitioner in Hamden County and I have the highest respect for Judge Carey. But Judge Carey obviously had some kind of caveat told to him when he became specially assigned. And I say that because it's his decision that two rogue assistant attorney generals perpetrated perhaps one of the greatest frauds that's ever been committed in this commonwealth. I would suggest to the court that a belief in the tooth fairy is every bit the same. It can't have possibly happened that way. And the reason that I asked to intervene was the lawyers in the Farrakh hearing with the special assignment were concerned about the drug matter. What about defendants that are similarly placed as Mr. Christian Miranda is? Meaning defendants who, who are in, did, didn't have Farrakh investig do the review and didn't have the assistant AGs involved in the case. Um, and, and, and what else? As you can tell from my pleadings, this case was prosecuted. Christian Miranda's case was prosecuted by the Attorney General's office. After all, the Attorney General held six news conferences on video to proclaim that my client was on the 10 most wanted list and was one of the most horrible human beings alive. At the same time that obviously she was engaged in other pursuits. And it is critical, and if I make no other point that I want this court to consider, where you look at the true findings of Justice Carey. Number one, he established that Justice Kinder was lied to. Well, that was pretty easy to establish. But number two, the lawyers involved in the Farrakh matter were smart enough after they got the 805 emails to ask for the threads for the emails. And the court never allowed that. Because I would suggest to you that if we got the threads, we would know exactly who did and who did not know what and when throughout this entire thing. But let me argue to you that it's absolutely clear and it would defy common sense that the Attorney General's office established what kind of punishment both Dukin and Farrakh were going to suffer. I can guarantee you that decision wasn't made by two rogue Assistant Attorney Generals. And the reason that no one has spent even a day in prison is because what if they actually told what they really knew and the facts really were? Are we really to believe that over a decade somebody was using the drugs that they were supposed to be analyzing and no one ever knew anything about it? That defies reality. We're back to the tooth fairy again. So the principle that you're asking us to adopt is that for the first time we should permit a criminal defendant who has a motion for new trial pending in the appeals court to seek to intervene in another criminal case because? It's because I filed the MNT, Your Honor, and it may be a mistake on my part, after I had filed to intervene in the Farrakh matter because as I started out this argument, I merely came to play. I've been criticized saying that I was so forum chopping. what that means chopping. to come to play, I mean, you're, to my knowledge, was, were the drugs in your case examined no. in the Amherst Drug Lab? No. So, so the, what is the, the relationship of the Cotto case to yours that we should allow you to intervene in that case? Because it was the only way to establish whether or not the actions of the Enterprise and Major Crimes Unit in actually beginning the entire egregious conduct on behalf of the government originated there. And that Justice Carey's finding that the police officers, nothing was askew, how can that possibly be? It still gets back to the fact that if this court's willing to accept that two assistant attorney generals perpetrated this fraud which cost the Commonwealth millions and millions of dollars. Let's face it that 
the elephant in the room is always Nelson versus Colorado. That's an effect here. So if we look at this, nobody suffered anything. Justice Kerry didn't even refer the matter for criminal prosecution. He didn't refer the matter to the Board of Bar Overseers. And just like the fact of Dukin doesn't do any time, Farrakh doesn't do any time, and the two people that he accuses as being the rogue assistant attorney generals, one moves on to a clerkship and another moves on to an administrative agency, they don't even need their licenses to practice law. So who is being held responsible for what happened here, since it's really very clear that Justice Kinder was lied to? Now, I thought that uh, Annie Dukin did do time, some time. Not to the best of my knowledge, relative. I mean, she may have done she's some time. She's doing time. She did time. She did time. I think she's finished her sentence. Yeah. Uh, OK, Mr. Wood, thank you. We'll hear from Mr. Bosian. Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Thomas Bosian. I represent the Commonwealth in this appeal. I'd just like to make a few quick points and answer any questions that the court has. Uh, the first is that there are good reasons for a defendant to file a Rule 30 motion in his own case and litigate post-conviction matters there, uh, one being that it avoids the trouble that could come from duplicative motions across the state, and the other being that generally a, a judge in the county with access to the case file will have uh, a more informed way to rule on the motion and referee any discovery disputes uh, that, that may occur. The second point is that uh, the petitioner has never, here has never alleged any firm connection to the Cotta litigation as a basis to intervene. Generally, when you think of intervention, you think of a, of a connection to a case and the existing parties to the case not being able to protect that interest adequately. But here, as the court's already alluded to, there's never been an allegation that the drugs were tested in Amherst, that Sonia Farrakh was involved in the testing, or that the two assistant attorneys general who were found by Judge Carey to have engaged in misconduct were involved in Mr. Miranda's case. Uh, unless the court has questions, the Commonwealth would be happy to rest on its brief. All right. Thank you. Thank you. 